I'm Eric Newton, and this is The Together Show. We all know relationships take work, but what is that work, and how do we do it? As a former divorce lawyer, I've watched thousands of couples break up firsthand. Having seen the worst in relationships, I decided to try to help couples stay together. So on this show, we talk to real couples and find out what love really looks like. Whatever the communication games we were doing, when they, as they were happening and Erwan was leading them and kind of responding to people and directing the evening, I noticed the kind of presence that he had in the room that was just, I had never seen it before, and I recognized it immediately. I was just attracted. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for listening. As I've mentioned before, we're getting a lot more email from listeners lately, and I wanted to read an email that came in this week and that I loved receiving. A listener named Lori writes, I just discovered your podcast a few weeks ago and immediately binge listened to as many episodes as I could. I've never heard people talk about intimacy and the inner workings of their relationships in such an honest, transparent, and thoughtful way. The interviews blew my mind and opened my heart in a way that I had no idea I needed. I appreciate the wide variety of relationship models that are represented and the generally open-minded approach taken in examining the various agreements people choose to follow. That being said, I found myself extremely disappointed when listening to the discussion between Jenny and Haley regarding sex work at strip clubs. I'm not suggesting that some clubs aren't depressing or that some women in the industry aren't exploited. But in my experience, many of the women who choose that work do it for reasons that are anything but exploitative and depressing. They find meaning and enjoyment in their work that goes way beyond a simple exchange of money. Lori, thank you so much for writing. Thank you for your praise, and thank you for your well-taken criticism of how I characterize sex work in that episode. And I couldn't agree more. Sex workers, just like all workers, sometimes find fulfillment and satisfaction in their work, and sometimes don't. My suggestion that sex work is uniformly depressing and exploitative is just plain wrong. And on a related note, I should say that we've been planning to produce a documentary series on the romantic lives of sex workers here at The Together Show. And part of the purpose of that series is to bring to light this very point. So thank you for your gentle reminder, Lori. And thank you for your email. It's much appreciated. If you have any questions or comments, or if you'd just like to say hello, please don't hesitate to email me at host at together.guide. Now on to the show. This week's episodes are about the opportunity to deepen our awareness that is presented by our sexual needs and by our inevitable conflicts in relationships. My guests this week are Erwan and Alicia Davon, two quite well-known personal development leaders who work in the areas of relationship and sexuality. Erwan and Alicia are probably most well-known for a program called The Pleasure Course, which is a seminar in which they teach extended orgasm, amongst a number of other topics. Now, having worked with so many couples in this very intimate way, Alicia and Erwan have a unique insight into what causes awareness to develop and how sex and our inevitable conflicts with our partners can help us to expand both our personal relationships and our awareness in general. We're also publishing two articles in the magazine this week that are related to the issues in the show. They're called, You're Just Not That Sexy and Turn Up the Heat. You can find both of those on our Facebook page or on our website, which is at www.together.guide. So with that, let's go to our interview with a very delightful couple Alicia and Erwan Davon. This was about almost 15 years ago, and I was in a master's program in psychology. I was planning on being a therapist, so that was like my life plan that I I thought I knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I was starting to study specifically female spirituality and sexuality and all these types of topics. And a friend of mine asked me, have I ever heard of this man, Erwan Davon? And have I heard of the pleasure course? Because it's this incredible experience where you 
touch the center of yourself and you can learn extended orgasm and everything in between. And so anyways, I had to meet Erewhon and I went to an event that he was leading in his home in the inner sunset at the time. And the event was about this course that he was teaching called the Pleasure Course. It was indirectly about that. It was actually a um, like a games night where he was teaching kind of um, communication games and things like that. But everybody there had either taken the Pleasure Course or they were looking at taking the Pleasure Course and everybody was talking about it. So it, I remember walking in there and just the vibe, I immediately felt really expansive and really high and I had this sense like these are my people this is cool and then there was Erewhon leading the night and I just remember looking at him and he was wearing um Uggs you know like Ugg boots yeah. which I grew up wearing because yeah. I'm from LA and then I went to school in Santa Barbara I'm like oh my god he's wearing Uggs he's so <laughs> cute and I just had this crush on him immediately and the whole night was super fun and then you know Long story short, we'll get more into the story, but I ended up taking the pleasure course when I was single, and he and I had also started dating before that. Before you took the course? Yeah. Oh, I am so fascinated about the (laughs) teacher-student dynamic. (laughs) I'm definitely going to come back and ask about that. Okay, so Erwan, do you have anything to add to that bit of the story? Um, That it was a a wild time in the sort of mid-90s, and um, Alicia uh, just blew my mind. You know, she really blew my mind. She came to that group, and um, we started dating, and, you know, we really formed a personal relationship and um, and, uh, spent most of a year in that relationship, and then she decided that she wanted to actually take the pleasure course, which was a little bit odd, her becoming a student, you know, from us dating. You know, but it was her experience as a student was short-lived. And then she basically uh, moved in <laughs> and, um, and uh, really everything took on a, a different light because I had been teaching with, you know, sort of short-term girlfriends and stuff like that and got in largely on my own. And, um, and were you non-monogamous? Yeah, I wasn't, well, I wasn't even not, yeah, I was just dating. You were just dating. You know, I was just dating yeah, okay. and, you know, uh, not even non-monogamous. I was just dating. Yeah. You know, I wasn't in a committed relationship and, and um, uh, it was, it was a very sort of wild time. I, it was the nineties, but it sort of felt like the seventies, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. I was like, you know, five years old in the seventies, but um and then, yeah, you know, and, and when Alicia came in, everything took on a very different cast because we, teaching from being in a relationship about uh, self-development and relationship development and, and even spirituality was a, was a very different lens to look at it through, you know. It was, in a sense, a more mature lens or a more adult lens or at least a later-in-life lens. And um, when Alicia came in, the work got much deeper, you know, it was it was less like kind of sort of wild camp, and it was more like you know really going into deep territory about uh, you know who am I, who is she, what is a relationship, how does this work? So I thought the courses were more about sexuality and less about relatedness. Now, of course, those two have to overlap, but am I missing a point somehow? Yes and no. Um, we teach extended orgasm, and we've been doing that. I mean, I've been doing that for over 20 years. One of the things that I found in my process of doing that was that by far the thing that made the biggest difference was whether the person was awake. In terms of their uh, conscious of their own consciousness. Yes. Mm. That that was, I could teach all the technique, I could teach all the man-woman dynamics, I could teach all the seduction skills, and I had this far-out life, and... Or, you know, early in the beginning, I had two girlfriends and we lived in a king size bed and it's this whole wild party time. And, you know, we can get into those juicy stories later if you like. But, you know, and I taught all this kind of stuff and it was a very fun community and all of this. And, and it was a ride and people got a lot. But to teach people where sexuality could actually go got me more into where a relationship could go. And really where both of those could go, I, it, you know, I, it, I flashed. I realized, like, really, it's about being awake. Yeah. And that's, you could have none of the technical skills at all. <laughs> you could have no seduction skills. You could have no nothing. But if you're awake, totally, things tend to work. Yeah. 
You know, and that's, and it, things really clicked for me there because, you know, I used to live in a Zen monastery and I, you know, have a, a background with a transformational organization we were talking about earlier. And um, it really, everything really came together. And then relationship and uh, sexuality became kind of a, the territory that we were practicing awakeness in and teaching people. Got it. And, and was that... Uh, you said that that transition occurred when Alicia came into the work. Well, when Alicia came into the work, things really deepened, um, and they deepened in that respect. But that that particular transformation uh, was was more of an evolution from the beginning, because my transformational background and Zen background and yoga background and so on uh, that started a lot earlier. Okay, got yeah. it. All right, all right. Now let me back up to the, uh, the leader-student or teacher-student dynamic that I, that I noticed in your description of how you met. So, Alicia, you walk into the room, and it's Erwan's event, and Erwan's in the front of the room teaching or leading this thing. How, how intoxicating or how attractive was that? It was very attractive. It was, and it was... If you can picture it, it was in his living room. So it wasn't like Erwan, you know, in a director's chair in front of a big group of people. It was his living room. There were all these people. People brought food. It was very friendly and homey. And then whatever the communication games we were doing, when they, as they were happening and Erwan was leading them and kind of responding to people and directing the evening, I, I noticed the kind of um, presence that he had in the room that was just, I had never seen it before and I recognized it immediately. I was just attracted and I was so attracted and I was in a relationship at the time with uh-huh. this other guy and it scared me how attracted I was to Erwan and this other guy I was with was great and he wasn't really into personal growth and transformation as I had been for the bunch of years before. Was he there at the event with you? No, he, he was a little not comfortable with right. that I went to this thing, but I went to this thing. You know, yeah. so I remember feeling like, oh, my gosh, I'm so attracted to Erwan. I love this work that he's doing, but I wouldn't even let myself participate after that evening for a few months because I had this conflict going sure. on. And I remember um, Erwan called a few days after the event, you know, because we all give our names and we're, we're there. And he's like, Hey, it was great to meet you. And I remember I couldn't even talk to him because I was so (laughs) wanting to be there with him and in the work. And I'm like, just call me some other time. And then I realized I shouldn't be in that other relationship. Now, was there a, was there a problem manifesting in the relationship when you walked into that room that you were conscious of, or did it only become conscious that it wasn't a right match after you met everyone? It was starting to go in that direction because the what I was studying in graduate school was alternative and kind of, I don't know, outside of the box, if you will. Yeah. And there were things that the guy I was with just kind of didn't get, didn't understand, didn't really want to talk about. Yeah. So I had a sense. And then it got really clear after I saw that there was something that would actually fulfill me yeah. on that level much more deeply. I'm really curious about that feeling you must have had when you first when you first saw him and you had that electric shock. And I'm curious about it because part of me wants to believe, you know, the, the romantic part of me wants to believe that you recognized a an ideal partner, and uh, and that was what was being activated in you. Another part of me wants to think that maybe you were trying to fill a hole from something that you knew was missing, and he represented. Uh, completion in in a way for you, and so you so your your body had a reaction because of the psychological hole that he was representing a possible match for. Do, do you am I am I, do you, are you making am I making sense? You're making sense, and what's interesting is you're asking me that. I'm realizing that when I first met Erwan, I knew that I wanted him in my life, and I didn't quite know. Okay, this is my romantic relationship partner right now you know that's not I wasn't aware of that yet Ah. I knew oh my god you know this guy's hot and really present in a way that I'd never seen before and I wanted to know more and get more involved but it wasn't like I'm going to be in relationship with him not this other guy 
Ah, yeah. But you were attracted to him. Oh, yes. I mean, and that insinuates relationship, I, I guess in our culture at least. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking this is going to be my life partner. And I was young at the time, so yeah. I wasn't even sure this other guy was going to be my life partner. I was in my early 20s. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's an open phase. Okay, all right. So then and so then, at what point did you start actually? We, well, we dated. We started dating and we formed uh, you know, a personal relationship. Yeah, you said you said that. Now that I think about it, but I'm trying to get the time lapse there. So, from uh, when you broke up, the timing and I. Am, yeah, uh, so it was about you know three six months later, something like that, yeah. and I had ended the relationship with this other guy, and then Erwan and I randomly ended up at this retreat course That's thing. Right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that that was going on. You know, that I went as a participant. Erwan had been teaching it and then decided to put all his focus on the pleasure course. So was participating in this particular retreat as a participant oh. one last time. So I were walking in to the kitchen on Friday. It was like a retreat for four days. We were away. And then Erwan, there he is sitting at the table eating breakfast. And I remember being like, what is he doing here? Oh my gosh. And I was like <laughs> so <laughs> riled up about it in a good way and I was scared and oh my gosh I'm available and what does this mean you know I was all hot and bothered yeah yeah so we connected there over did you, the weekend did you sense that Erwan well I yeah I definitely sensed that Alicia was interested and we had a lot of connections you know the course was full of exercises and stuff like that sort of uh you know breathing exercises this kind mm. of thing and um you know, and then at the end, because I knew Alicia was interested and I knew I was attracted to her, I said, hey, you know, why don't we go out for a cup of coffee? And she just <laughs> turned me down like I was completely <laughs> insane, you know, for asking. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, here's my number. If you, if you want to go out for some coffee, just give me a call. And then a month later, I got a call. And we had a nice chat. And how, how did it go? Wait, wait, wait. Did, did the turn down make you more attracted? It's a good question. Um, no, it didn't make me more attracted. Um, it, uh, I mean, I, you know, to be honest, made me less attracted. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I was still attracted, and I still liked her, and um, you know, enough so that a month later, I, I followed up, and we had a chat, and then I remember some version of the same thing happened. Yes, what was happening was that I was, we were so connected that I was scared. And so when Erwan appropriately, you know, asked me out at the end of this weekend, then I was like, why are you even asking me out? You know, looking at him like he's crazy. I'm like, I don't think so. And then <laughs> the way he responded to me, I will never forget. It was so confident and responsive to me. He's like, all right, well, if you change your mind, here's my number. And then he walked away. And I was left there like, oh, where are you going? Oh my gosh. And then so for four months after that, like I would reach out, we'd have this incredible phone conversation. Then again, appropriately, Erwan would be like, well, why don't we get together? You know, why don't you come out to the city and have some tea? And I'd be like, I don't know. I don't think so. And he'd be like, all right, you know, see you later. And then he was gone. And this went on for four months. And then there was a night I remember this really vividly. I was in Santa Barbara helping lead a workshop and I was driving back up the coast to Berkeley where I lived and I was about to run out of gas and it was really dark and I was on the part of the freeway where there's like no gas stations for a long time and I was like, oh shit, you know, and then I thought I should call Erwan to tell him I'm scared or see what to do or something and then I, re I realized I like this guy. What am I doing? And I called him right away on my, I had my car phone. Remember before everybody had sexy yeah, cell phones, this yeah. big chunky car phone. And I picked it up. I'm like, I'm being silly. Like, I, yes, I want to get together. And then he's like, great, come over tomorrow. <laughs> That's where it started. So you just, you said, what, what was I doing? What were you doing? I still don't totally understand it. I was scared. I think the intensity of our connection was, it was very real. Like I knew that Erwan was really with me. He was present. He could tell how I felt. He wasn't going to bullshit me. He was there. And it scared me. I couldn't really hide out with him. And I knew that from interacting with him so far. So that's scared. the fear that was being activated was this notion that you wouldn't be able to hide out? 
Something like that. I mean, it's been such a long time. I don't remember sure. exactly, but it was something like that. Like, there's nowhere to hide with this guy. And yeah. I wanted that, and I was afraid of that. And then the strong reaction the first time, it sounds like the, the subsequent times that you turned him down were a little bit more gentle. Uh, but the first time you turned him down, it sounds like it was really strong. Uh, same thing, fear? You mean at the end of the weekend? Yeah. I think I was particularly... Um, open from being at this weekend retreat kind of thing and my fear just came up like almost unexpectedly like I couldn't even control it so it felt that way anyways wow. and I had a reaction I was like no <laughs> no I don't want to go out <laughs> even though I really did I mean we're all as human beings we're <laughs> very um addicted drawn to our contraction yes you know so people want intimacy but they also avoid it like the plague you know, and you asked a really interesting question about filling holes. Mm. You know, presence is the most attractive thing in a human being, and we're completely drawn to it. But anybody's presence is attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, presence is presence. It's, it's supremely attractive. Yeah. But we also really resist it because presence is a threat to our formulated identity, our formula identity, our methods and strategies, how we survived our early upbringing and everything. So people are in a very strong bind between how they survived their you know, early upbringing and so on and their, their true nature. True nature. True nature, being, consciousness, ah, okay. right, uh, right, you know, right. all the words we could use for that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strong pull in two directions that, you know, people have a lot of difficulty with. And, um, you know, I, I like the language that you used. People do try, people try to find things in sex, money, success, um, popularity, uh, certain t types of bodies, all kinds of stuff, having a pr being a particular way, looking a particular way, to fill holes, you know, that you can only, you can't even fill that hole because it's, there's not even really a hole, actually. It's more like a blockage of something that's already there. But we do try to fill that sense of emptiness with all kinds of stuff, and relationships and sex are like right at the top. And now your, your level of awareness that you have about this now and the way that you're speaking about it, did you have that at the time that this was all occurring? Yeah, basically, um, but, but it's something that's evolved. When I was in the Zen um, monastery, the, the uh, first, th that's really where it opened up. You know, the first night I got there, uh, I got there a day, then went to sleep, and the first morning that I, they woke me up at uh, four, 4 or 4.30 in the morning, for hours of meditation, you know, and with practically no instruction, because Zen is objectless meditation. You don't even focus on anything. So I'm in this gorgeous room with like, you know, 150 people, and they're all in black outfits facing the wall, and I'm there, and, you know, and I'm just falling asleep, and my body is beyond uncomfortable, and it's basically like torture, you know, and uh, midday, that that day after the morning meditation and so on, I went to the uh, monk in, in charge of the new monks and said, this is not for me, <laughs> you know, like whatever's going on here, like I'm not into it. And um, he asked me this very interesting question. He said, well, were you in the, you know, the Zen uh, meditation hall in the morning? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, well, then you were doing everything right. Somehow that kind of clicked, you know, like, that I was, I got something about something, like something about practicing or something about like living it or something like that. I didn't even know quite what I'd gotten. Then I went back the next morning, same thing, it got me up early, all the rest of the bells and all this stuff and go in there and I'm meditating and I'm tired and I'm upset and my body hurts and all the rest of this kind of stuff. But I let myself feel all of that and I didn't resist any of it. And all of a sudden, like amidst all of this discomfort, because the discomfort was there, there was just an infinite sea of consciousness saturated with love and peace and like the, the, the reality of what we are. That clicked on day two for you? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it clicked in proportion to the discomfort. <laughs> it always does. Right. We're usually that's not right. on day two. Right. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, but so that's really, you know, uh, you know, that that was one of the biggest awakening experiences I've had. And I've, you know, there's been a few. There was, you know, there was that. And then later on, I realized that, like, okay, yeah, that was amazing. But then there was. Um, another awakening experience. It was a little bit more of like an insight or a realization of I have to re I have to know that that's the most important. I have to stand behind that that's the most important. And that was another demarcation line where I not only had that realization, but I said, you know, that's more important than anything else. That being awake and that consciousness, that's the center, and start to organize my life around that. Then there was a, another one a few years later about like, okay, and that, that involves practice and ultimately constant practice. There is no realization where you're just sort of coasting around. You like, don't just become Buddha and you're done. Right. Buddha is more like a verb. <laughs> it's more like a practice <laughs> of a devotional surrender to what's true, what we are. Yeah. So there's been like these stages, but that really was the big opening uh, right in the beginning. Okay, so... So this is a question I've wanted to explore around the concept of being a teacher for a while, and it overlaps perfectly with your relationship. So coming from that place of, of um, awareness of self and uh, infinite consciousness, which is a place in some ways characterized by an understanding that everything is whole and complete and that nothing needs to be changed and that there's no need to protect. That's right. That's one way to characterize that place. And then we step into this world of agenda and activity and desire, and it all comes rushing right back in. Right. And one role in this world of activity and desire that you can take on is the role of being a teacher. And being a teacher is great because it, um, it's kind of a powerful position. If you're a good teacher, people love you, and it's really safe. It's just so safe. Everybody adores you, and they adore the thing that you're talking about. And then identity can come in and say, oh, this is true. The things that I'm saying are definitely true, and I am definitely special, and therefore I'm safe. Which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's also a little bit of missing the point from well, which totally the teaching the comes, point. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, to I mean, it's like, you know, a, a couple of things. I mean, being a teacher... At, at first, it kind of looks like that. Um, then it becomes like the most unsafe thing because you're public. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you're, you know, this pe people's reaction to presence and being, which because that has an ego dissolving effect. You know, it it's you know people take shots at you. Yeah. You know, so on one hand, it does, at one hand, it sort of looks safe, but as you become more and more, you know, a lot of the Zen masters retreated from society really because it was so, you know, the, the, the egoic response is so intense to that. But to more to your point of the, the sort of being special, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, an, that's an error. You know, that's a spiritual ego. And... Um, you know, it's it's just not true. And, uh, you know, I know for myself, I'm currently in psychoanalysis. I've got 12 years of psychoanalysis, uh, three to four times a week under my belt. Um, you know, if we get into my childhood at all, you know, in this interview, you know, I have one of those remarkably different, uh, difficult uh, childhoods. So it's... Um, you know, realization is not, you know, there's people who say they're perfectly realized and they have any problems and they're only identified as God consciousness and all the rest of that. You know, I, th there's one or two people, because I study those folks, that I would say, you know, that's actually probably the case for that person, you know, a hundred years ago. But most of the people who say that's not actually really true, you know, and it was a big revelation for me as I got to know some of these people and had some level of development myself, that it was much more about having space for all of the difficulties and the wounds and the gradual evolution that is, you know, part of life for, for most all of us, actually. You know, that it was much more um, 
having space for all of that, the same way I had space for the discomfort in the second day at the Zen monastery, that, that that's more of a realistic approach. And there is something that evolves and changes. And in a certain sense, things do become easier and the presence shines through more freely. But just as the presence shines through more clearly, the earlier issues and difficulties and attachments and, you know, if we're going to talk psychological talk, you know, so go sort of go backwards in time to like being, you know, very young and an infant and the way we're conditioned and created in our infancy, you know, you start dealing with like those deep archaic psychological structures and then, you know, existential structures and, you know, not to use fancy words, but epistemological and phenomenological ways that things occur. And it, in some ways it gets more and more challenging. Well, let me bring it home to the power dynamic in the relationship again. So, uh, because it creates some safety and it, it, it uh, that you're saying isn't actually legitimate in some ways. Right. Um, but it is the reason that Alicia was initially aware of you. Well, I mean, I, you know. <laughs> there I, are I, perks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there, are, there are definitely perks to being teachers, no question about that. But, you know, I think. But then it, but then it continued through, right? Because then you got into a relationship and then she got into a course of yours. So, um, so that's what I'm really curious about is how did you manage the dynamic? There's nothing wrong with the dynamic, uh, even if it was unconscious, because it can be very erotic and very powerful and very romantic to have that role. But I'm assuming you probably were conscious of it. So how, what did you do with it? And how did you manage it? Well, Alicia wasn't real. I mean, she took the pleasure course, but she mm -hmm. wasn't really a student for any period of time. She was really my girlfriend. Mm. Like, I never thought of Erwan as my teacher. Like, I never described him as that. It was yeah. more like, oh, you know, I remember I lived in this big house in Berkeley with five women. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take Erwan's course this weekend. You know, it was kind of like, I like Erwan and we're dating and we're lovers. I'm going to go do this pleasure course. You know, so I, we didn't have a purely teacher-student relationship it. ever. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and the other thing about me, you know, hopefully less so now, but <laughs> certainly, you know, uh, you know, back then is like, you know, I remember at some point being over at Alicia's house in Berkeley and just being like upset and a mess and this kind of thing. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of artistic, tragic, romantic type and I kind of wear my emotions on my <laughs> sleeve. So I think it became pretty clear to her like, you know, uh, he's he's not some big shiny guru guy or something like that. And it's and I and I I've had the good fortune, I think, because of the Zen background, to learn not to portray myself that way because it's just not true. Yeah. You know, and it like, you know, that's bad teacherdom, and it's all and the job that that does on teachers who take that role and portray themselves that way, like, it it it's devastating to them because they they section off and segment off parts of themselves that end up playing out unconsciously. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's so true. Okay. Now I'm curious about conflict. So you must have had a honeymoon phase at first where you were just passionate about each other and everything was perfect. Um, when did challenges start to creep in? Mm -hmm. I think the main conflict that we had starting in the very beginning and that we've worked through over the years in our relationship is working together because I got super involved in Erwan's organization, which is now our organization. Right away. Right away. Wow. I mean, when I was in the pleasure course, I was, you know, like I said, I was planning to be a therapist. I was two years into my program. I was about to start this internship and I... I already kind of had a feeling like this isn't exactly what I want to do, but wasn't sure what else I wanted to do. And being at the pleasure course and seeing the community that Erwin had created and, and the teaching and how much it hit me, all of that, I knew I want to do this. I want to be here. I want to start volunteering here and learn to teach this. And um, so quickly I got involved first as a volunteer, then just was so enthusiastic to jump in that I started becoming involved with the business. And the dynamic there brought a lot of conflict. Um, What's because, an example? Well, 
I'll, I'll give you the, the first example I ever remember, which is that we had an event at the house that I lived in on Dolores Street, and Erwan ended up moving in there with me after a while. And I knew nothing about running events and having people over, and I knew nothing about that. And Erwan came up to me and said, okay, you know, these, these things need to happen. And, and, and it was like he was in his working mode. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I remember feeling really triggered by that. Like, oh, this isn't my boyfriend, Erwan. This is Erwan running his business. And I just didn't know how to relate to him. And then my stuff came up of, oh, no, he's telling me what to do. And I got all triggered. That's the first time I remember feeling like, oh, this is different territory here. What did you do with the trigger? At that point, I just was like, okay. <laughs> I just did whatever because there were all these people coming into the house and I needed to do something. And I kind of put it aside. Like I ignored it and didn't bring it up right away of, oh, wow, I felt this. And how are we going to handle that in our relationship? I kind of just put it aside. But of course, it kept coming up again and again over the years, especially as we got more and more intimately involved in creating the organization together. Yeah. Yeah. And then how did you finally handle it? Or, I mean, it sounds like it's ongoing, but I'm curious if the, that initial series of triggers, that the, the, those initial experiences of that thing coming up and you're pushing it aside. Mm -hmm. You push it aside, it's just going to ferment. <laughs> it's going to grow something. Which it did. And there were, it was complex because on one level, Erwan had been running his organization for years and knew a lot of things about that that I didn't know. Yeah. That if I wanted to be involved, like I said I did and I did, I'd need to learn. Yeah. So I needed to kind of be able to put us, not put our relationship aside, like suppress it, but be willing to receive instruction. Mm -hmm. And that was hard for me for a long time. And then, so working with that uh, was probably the biggest challenge that I had. Yeah. I'm wondering, at the same time, Erwan, were you concerned about bringing Alicia into your business, given that you guys were just dating? You know, not um, as concerned as I probably should have been, <laughs> um, you know, because those, you know, those challenges started and then, you know, working with your uh, partner, you know, uh, you know, now, now my wife, you know, I'm her husband. I mean, it's a whole other level of challenge for a relationship that, um, you know, it's it's just a much bigger challenge than I think people generally understand. Uh, you know, we used to have a home office and we worked together and it was like, you know, you sort of lose that ability to come back to somebody after hours and like just be with them in a completely different context. You know, and that's, you know, so it's been been years, you know, learning, to, you know, okay, you know, to sort of separate, uh, you know, the, the uh, us as sort of working together and us as husband and wife. And it's, that, that's, I would say, the biggest challenge that we've uh, had to deal with. I'm really curious about uh, um, sex when you're angry at each other at work. We have <laughs> an extended orgasm date pretty much every day. And date? Date, uh -huh. yeah, like in the mornings generally, you know, we wake up together and um, I'll put my finger on Alicia's clitoris and, and she'll have an extended orgasm for 10 or 15 minutes. And that's a practice. The same way meditation um, for us is a practice in the morning. So one of the things that we've found, it's kind of like back to the spiritual conversation for a second. You know, no matter what's going on, it's a good idea to meditate. And there's a realization where, like, okay, it's more about the practice than it is about some realization I had 20 years ago. Because if I'm not practicing that realization, then it's not, it doesn't become alive. It, if it doesn't get to the body and the what you're doing when, it's not a, it's an insight. You know, so things kind of go from the. And head, it's a story. And it's a past. story in the past. Yeah. So, right. So, you know, the insight is great for a second, but you want it to get into the heart and do I really want this and the yeah. devotion and the surrender and then into the body and the living it. Yeah. And then something is more really manifest yeah. versus people get high. You know, you read a book, you can read a book, get very high in reading a book. It's very different than half an hour of meditation. Right. So uh, extended orgasm is a daily practice for us. And 
whether we're in a fight or not or whatever, I mean, the only thing that pretty much would stop it is a really, really serious fight or like if we're, you know, in, in you know, Alicia's in L.A. visiting her parents or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've found it really works well for couples to have their relationship get the same kind of time and space that, um, you know, for example, people's work life gets or people who are very spiritual, their meditation practice gets or their yoga practice gets. And what that does is, you know, you asked about honeymoon period earlier. You know, there's always a, a honeymoon period in the beginning and the other person can't do any wrong and, you know, they, they burp and they fart and you're like, wow, they're so free and they <laughs> show up late and it's like, oh my God, they've transcended time and just all this <laughs> stuff, you know, like that. But then after a while, that novelty goes away. Yeah. And what we found is that if there's a, a devotion in, in the form of practice, time and space, to the relationship that it will achieve higher peaks of turn on, of intimacy, of connection, of sexuality, of attraction, which is usually what disappears for people after they go from the dating phase to the boyfriend-girlfriend phase. You know, how do you reach higher peaks of attraction, higher peaks of sexual turn on? Well, that's it for part one of our interview with Alicia and Erwan, folks. Be sure to tune in on Thursday, in which we'll explore the issues of extended orgasm, non-ejaculatory sex, and how all of these impact our awakening. If you'd like to learn more about Alicia and Erwan, you can find their website at www.erwandavon.com. That's E-R-W-A-N-D-A-V-O-N.com. And I'll put that link in the show notes. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to us on iTunes. It makes a big difference when you do that. If you have any questions or comments or if you'd like to be on the show, please reach out via one of our platforms. You can find our website at www.together.guide. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash together show. Twitter and Instagram are both at together underscore show, or you can email me at host at together.guide. Our producer is Charlene Goto. Our web designer is Courtney Munna. Our art director and my one and only is Aubrey Pick. Honey, I love you so much. Thanks once again to my guests, Erwan and Alicia. Erwan, seriously, the second day at the monastery, that still makes me crack up. I can't even believe it. <laughs> it's so great. Be sure to tune in for Thursday's episode in which you will hear... But you can't produce extended orgasm in somebody else's body that's, that's really orgasm unless you're in the experience together. See, orgasm by definition is a state of release. It's a state of body and mind release. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.